Sometimes you've designed a 3D printed part and you want to give it off to somebody else to make it. But when the sample comes back or the first batch of parts comes back, they're different from what you had expected. Why is that? And how can you avoid it? In this video, we're going to talk about how to design parts so that they can be made on any machine with any slicer settings at any time with any material without having to worry about the translation in between so that anyone at any time with any machine in any material and any slicer settings can produce that part reliably. Now, why does this actually matter? Well, it matters for wanting to manufacture the part. If you are just making it yourself on your own machine, you are an artisan. That's like saying, I have this tool that I like and I sharpened it just so and I use it with so much strength and I have this much skill. It's very specific to you. But if you want somebody else to make your parts for you, you need to be able to design a part that can be made and manufactured. This is true of every type of process, CNC machining, injection molding, 3D printing. You have to design for that process so that the part is robust so that it can be made reliably by other people without special tricks or special expertise or special little recipes. If you have secret sauce in how your product is made that someone has to know in order to make it, then your product is not manufacturable and you'll never be able to get past just the artisan hobby sort of stage. So you wanna make sure that you're designing parts to be robust so that they can be made at any time in any way. So there are about six primary features of this that you wanna be aware of that we're gonna go through in depth all the way through here. Number one, designing so that your part either has reliable supports or it does not need supports. Designing so that it is strong without needing to have variations in infill or special wall thickness settings. Making sure all the edges are tight and crisp and pretty and there's no wobble or weird artifacts in the surface of your part. Making sure that the part cannot warp or does not have deformation on the first layer that can cause defects that make the part look less quality. Surface finish, again, ensuring there's no aberrations and if they come up, they don't jack up the cost of your parts in production and you are actually able to produce thousands of them without having problems cause a bunch of them to be defects. And lastly, tolerances. How do you make sure that all of your parts always fit together regardless of the material or the machine that they're being made with? So let's go ahead and dive right in, starting off with supports. So if you are outsourcing your part to be designed, you generally do not want to use auto-generated supports. They're very difficult to remove. They increase the cost of your part. They can cause damage to your part and cause it to look bad. And sometimes you just don't need them all. Sometimes you just need a couple of small pillars. So the best option, if you have to have support, is to design the support yourself inside of CAD. We have an entire video talking about how to design support into a piece, and you can go ahead and check that out here. But of course, really the best option for support is no support at all. There's very simple design rules that you can follow in order to eliminate support. Make sure there's no vertical overhangs. Chamfer them, smooth them out so that something is built up to them. Make sure the part is oriented so that supports are minimized and make sure you design certain areas of the part so they don't need support. Again, you can throw in little support bridges and pillars inside of places. So like if you have a hole in the side of a part, you can just put a small little vertical bar inside of there so that that hole doesn't have a big old long bridge. And lastly, if you have an area that is supported, maybe just fill it in. 3D printed parts are able to have a lot of volume. You can make something chunky and big. So if you feel like you have this vertical overhang because you needed to cut out all the material underneath it, don't do that. Just leave that material there and have it be a part of the part. It can improve the aesthetics of it all. It definitely improves the support situation and it can improve the strength of it all. So lean into the chunkiness of the part. And if you do that, you eliminate a lot of the needs for support. Next, strength. Strength is a really big one. 3D printed parts are a little bit weird. This part is weaker in this direction than it is side to side. So you want to make sure that you have the density or the wall thickness that you want. Now, normally this is done inside of slicers. You will make the wall thicker in order to make it stronger on the outside, kind of like an I-beam. And then you might increase the density of the infill so that the part is stronger in that direction. But neither of those are particularly very good. A better way of getting strength in the walls is to actually put in what we call micro features on the outside. Again, something you can do inside of CAD so that regardless of slicer settings, it will always have the strength that you want it for. A simple way of doing this is basically running really small tubes up along the inner side of the wall. So it's a really reliable way to get that thick wall feature so that you have a strong outer wall that can be really stiff. You can also use the same sort of technique to sprinkle in strength. If you have a corner or a gap that needs to be stronger, so you need more material down there, you can put in those micro features which will induce more walls inside of that area so that it's stronger at the core, but then the rest of it can be really lightweight and easy. And lastly, again, just make it fatter. 
Don't design an I-beam, design a brick, but allow the brick to be filled in with infill. And that allows you to get a lot of strength without a lot of material. This is what a lot of people misunderstand if they come from previous ways of designing stuff. Most other processes are all about removing volume. If you're molding something, you need to cut as much out as you can. That is not true for 3D printing because we fill it in with infill. So if you need a part to be stronger, make it fatter. You're allowed, it's okay. Don't try to slim it down and then try to make it strong by throwing in a bunch of infill, because that's just nothing. Just imagine the same amount of infill and then you spread it out and make it less dense over a wider area. You end up with a stronger part without having to deal with slicer settings. So just modify the geometry of the piece so that it is stronger. You can also do simple things like chamfering corners and that kind of stuff, which is a great way to lead into this next feature. Chamfering corners not only has a strength benefit because if you go from a really sharp corner to something kind of rounded, the rounded shape is able to distribute force over it a lot more so it can be stronger. But rounding corners is actually valuable in another way. If you are printing a part vertically like this, again, coming up this direction, you want all of the outer corners to be a little bit filleted because what that allows the machine to do is to move around that corner easily rather than taking a 90 degree turn. Imagine you were in a car and you don't change your speed and you just turn 90 degrees versus going around a smooth roundabout. There's a big difference in how that behaves. The car forces you to the outside. Well, when a nozzle does that, it does the same thing and it shows up as vibration along the outside of the part, or maybe that corner will just be a little bit out of whack. So just make sure that you round out those corners in the vertical edges and that will improve that a lot. But then you also wanna do one thing other for the lower edges, which is chamfering the first layer edge. So this part that's sitting on the bed right here has a very small chamfer along the outer side. We generally recommend about one millimeter. That chamfer, make sure that you don't have to worry about side extrusion or different flow rates. It all disappears with a simple chamfer along the bottom. So that's the way to clean up all of your edges so that you get a part that looks really crisp and really nice and really beautiful. And then if you have a chamfer on the bottom, you can apply one to the top in order to create symmetry throughout. And again, this part right here can be printed with any resolution, any material on any machine, and it will still function just fine as intended. It's actually a print in place. So we're gonna use this for a couple more examples. So warp. Warp can be a huge issue, even with simple materials like PLA. If you have a big long square part with sharp edges on it all, those edges can pull and shrink and warp up on the edges. So how do you eliminate that warp or make sure it's not an issue? Well, again, you don't want to turn on a brim or turn on a raft or turn on some special setting or have the temperatures just set just right for your material so that it doesn't warp for your part. You want it to be reliable. The easiest way to design this into CAD so that it'll work everywhere is to use mouse ears. If you have a sharp corner, put just a small circle over there on that corner and then it is held down. It has more surface area to adhere to the bed. And then those brims can be easily removed. They don't leave a large defect or mar on the part in any sort of way. And if you're being really clever with it, you can design the mouse ears so they just barely touch the corners so that they can be snipped off clean and you just have the smallest little pot mark there rather than some big old grind in a razor blade removal that can be indeterminate. If you really have a complex part, then you can design in a brim. And the, a way of doing this is to literally just design a 0.3 millimeter plane, insert it into your model, and then merge your model with that plane. But then you basically have this big round sheet. You do want it to be round. You don't want it to be square. Again, warping. But with that round plane, that gives you a sheet to work from. You can also design in a raft by making a thicker like one millimeter plane and then spacing it out about 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters from the actual part that you wanna be printed. That way the first layer of the part is clean and can come off of that designed raft, which can be really, really useful. Especially if your part has a really complex first layer, like if you're trying to stack up a hundred tiny little parts on one single build plate, you should design a raft for that so that they all come off on that raft and then you just twist it and they all fly off. That is the most reliable way of designing a part like that so that you can knock off a hundred tiny little pieces without having to worry about one failing while a first layer is going down. So designing that first layer and using a raft of brim or mouse ears in order to hold it down reliably is really important and can also improve the quality of your parts. Surface finish. A lot of people don't like the way 3D printed parts look or think they're worried about it. Generally, consumers really don't care if a part is 3D printed. Like this per looks perfectly all right and perfectly reasonable in the context of consumer products. But sometimes you don't want the layer lines or you wanna print it really fast with draft angles. The easiest way of getting around this to make sure that again, one printer doesn't have a different, different surface finish from another printer if you're uploading it to a surface like Teleport, the way to do it 
is to just apply a texture. There are tools like Formlabs Texture Engine where you can basically just create a black and white image of the texture that you want on this part, upload the STL, and then it will apply the texture across the entire outer surface of the part. This is really useful if you wanna brand it because you can basically take a logo and have it spattered across the outside of your part, which can be really, really nifty. The other thing you can do is just apply a little bit of noise to the outside to where it's roughened up. You can do this actually by doing this type of knurling. If you take these knurling patterns, make them a half a millimeter wide and a half millimeter spaced, they will show up as fuzzy texturing at the top and they won't look like knurling, like these lines right there. It'll just look like fuzz. So that's an easy way to create that sort of texture on a part, which is just to create a spiral around the outside that's really small and really tight. And unlike every other manufacturing process in existence, texturing is free for 3D printing because it adds some print time to it, but it doesn't really add any material. So it's a really efficient way to get a different surface finish. When with other processes, you would have to do all these other sorts of features in order to get to what you wanted. Last, and probably one of the hardest, is tolerances. If you want this part to twist and work the way you want it to everywhere, how do you design it so that the tolerances are universal? Well, number one, you want to design it so that you have as much room as possible. So if you're asking what should be the space between the cylinder and the outer rim of this part that twists like this, well, the answer to that is just as much space as you can possibly give it. That's an easy one. If you can go for a low tolerance, that's really safe and you don't have to worry about textures or anything else getting in the way make the gaps and the holes as big as possible. Now you're still dealing with quality and you can hear that while we have a rattle in there, it's mainly from the pills, it's not really from the parts. So you can see the tolerance on this, that lid is not really moving, it is in there tight. How do you make something appear tight and premium? Well, number one, you want to design it so that you have what are called compliant features. And compliant features are basically a spring. So a little spring to sit along here. So if my hands were both springs, they can sit here and press it right there and it looks like that is sitting in there tightly, even though it's just being pressed by springs. Don't design a hole and another part the same size as that hole. Make the hole have some little springs and leaflets around the outside. We call them grip fins. So that when you insert something into it, those fins hold it stable and tight. We have a little bit of a feature like this. This is a spring down on the bottom to where those bumps move from one bump to the next, which holds this really stable and looks nice and also helps to create that clicking feature that we wanted with this part. So using compliant features like that to where a part is pressed into position can help a lot. If you want a lid, don't have it just drop into there. You might add threads, that way it can tighten down onto it and threads can be really sloppy so that it goes on loose and easy, but then it tightens down firmly. Another thing you can do is to make sure, again, to design chamfered edges on all your parts so that it starts out inserting really easily and then it gets tighter the further you press it in. That is really great for like square lids to where you wanna insert a top plate that locks in you can insert the top plate, tamp it down, and then it locks in and the layer lines interact with each other. This is a really good way of doing lids. So just go really low tolerance right from the start and then use mechanisms to make it more valuable there. Cause like this sort of thing was not possible to manufacture just a few years ago, but now you can manufacture it in anything that you want. So this wasn't even an option to where high tolerance was required, but now high tolerance is not required because you can create these really complex mechanisms inside of a part for free. But again, the basic principles of using wedges, allowing your parts to be a little bit compliant and to give a little bit or to press in on stuff, that will all help a bunch. Hopefully that helps you. Those are the six main areas where you want to modify a part to make sure that it is manufacturable by anybody. Again, it's so reliable to design these parts to be robust in this way to where they can be printed at any time. Because you want to scale up, you probably don't want to build your own factory. This is why we built the service like Teleports to where you can just upload a 3D model and then when somebody orders it from you, we will print it out and ship it directly to them for you and you just get paid without having to worry about running 3D printers and keeping them greased and making sure they're turned on and running them overnight and all the hassle of running a print farm. Instead, you're able to focus on designing really, really great stuff and then you can just design them to be robust enough so they can be printed on any service that's available. Teleport, if you wanna check it out, is over at slantpod.com and then you can start up your 3D printing side hustle without actually having to do all the work yourself. You can just design cool stuff. Have a great day, everybody.